This is Christian Breton of Quebec City, Quebec. Listen to the International Radio Report every Sunday morning at 10.30 on CKUT 90.3 FM in Montreal. Welcome everybody to the International Radio Report for Sunday, May the 26th, 2024. We thank you for joining us. My name is Sheldon. I'm here with Jill. We have 30 minutes of news and information from the world of radio for you. Uh, some stories from... North America, some stories from around the world, and we'll wrap up with the calendar of upcoming ham radio contests and events. We'll get right down to business this week. We have a lot of interesting things going on. For the ham radio operators out there in the audience, we have a story that has some impact on you. And Jill, you came across this story in connection with some of the technical and computer work that you do. Yeah, I have my uh, tech channel that uh, has all sorts of news, and some of the news is about security and hacking and all of that. And I saw that go through, which is about the ARRL that uh, has service disruptions right now. So this comes from the ARRL itself for some of the news and updates. So first of all, um, the first on May 15th, the ARRL news, the original news, Uh, we are in the process of responding to a serious incident involving access to our network and headquarters-based systems. Several services, such as Logbook of the World and the ARRL Learning Center, are affected. Please know that restoring access is our highest priority, and we are expeditiously working with outside industry experts to address the issue. We appreciate your patience. Then they updated on May 19th, say um, some members have asked whether their personal information has been compromised in some way. ARRL does not store credit card information anywhere in their systems, and we do not collect social security numbers. Our member database only contains publicly available information like name, address, and call sign, along with ARRL specific data like email preferences and membership dates. And the last update is from May 22nd. We are continuing to address a serious incident involving access to our network and systems. Several services, such as Logbook of the World and the ARL Learning Center, are affected. We have heard from many Logbook of the World users asking about the status of the service and its data. This is not a uh, server issue and a, the data from the Logbook of the World is secure. Our editorial and production team is preparing the July issue of KOST Magazine, which is still going to press. It may be delivered a few days late to members who receive print subscriptions, but the digital edition should be published on time. We appreciate your continued patience as our staff and others work tirelessly to restore affected systems. What came out of the one of the websites that I have um, information about, you know, uh, data breaches of all sorts, is that it would seem that somebody has hacked into the systems of the ARRL. We're not talking about ransomware at this time, but the biggest problem with these breaches when somebody gets into a system, we don't know the full extent until quite some time later, because they have to evaluate all of it. But it's big enough to have disrupted their system and logbook of the world and all of that. So it's it's a bigger breach than maybe they want to admit, but they're trying to let everybody um, know that their data isn't, you know, whatever they could get or hackers could get out of there uh, is nothing very personal. So uh, hopefully they're going to be able to get back on time and we'll maybe have an update on what really happened. Yeah, for any of our new listeners, or um, if you're not familiar with ARRL, it's the American Radio Relay League, and they are sort of the the umbrella organization for amateur radio activity in the United States. So um, they service on you know tens of thousands of people out there as licensed ham radio operators, and the logbook of the world is an important tool that they have for uh, contesters and. QSL hunters and that sort of thing. So it is a big issue, uh, affects a lot of people. And uh, as Jill said, we hope we'll uh, get some updated information for you uh, for next week's program. Our next story is uh, the continuing saga of AM radio in every vehicle act. And uh, this time the bill to require AM in cars 
is moving ahead into the House in the United States. This comes from Paul McLean of Radio World. The AM for Every Vehicle Act is moving forward in the House of Representatives. The legislation has been approved by a voice vote in a House Energy and Commerce subcommittee. Senators Ed Markey and Ted Cruz jointly applauded the development, calling it another clear signal that millions of consumers are demanding broadcast AM radios remain in their vehicles. We are glad that our House colleagues recognize the importance of AM radio for Every Vehicle Act and look forward to working with our colleagues to enact this critical public safety legislation into law. Markey and Cruz recently said the AM bill has filibuster-proof support from more than 60 members of the Senate, and it has 254 House co-sponsors. Last summer, the Senate Commerce, Science and Transportation Committee approved similar legislation by voice vote. The National Association of Broadcasters President and CEO Curtis Legite also put out a statement. He says America's broadcasters are grateful to representatives of Bill Arrakis, of Pallone, McMorris, Rogers, uh, and Jan Shaskowski, and the bipartisan champions of this legislative effort for their leadership and commitment to preserving the indispensable role of AM radio in local communities across the country. The bill would require AM radio as a safety feature in all new vehicles. In wake of the announcement, Gary Shapiro, CEO of the Consumer Technology Association, released the following statement. The Consumer Technology Association urges Congress to pursue a pro-innovation agenda. Legislation that removes the protections of Section 230 threatens freedom of speech, and the internet as we know it. Mandating AM radios in every car will hinder safety and entertainment innovations and increase production costs. While we continue to review the draft American Privacy Rights Act, federal privacy legislation should be clear in preempting state laws and protecting companies from frivolous litigation, he continued. Missing from subcommittee action this week is the Self-Drive Act, pro-innovation legislation to advance the American autonomous vehicle industry and save lives. So there is still some opposition to passing this law to uh, uh, make it mandatory to have AM radios in the cars, but it looks like they may have the numbers to finally get this thing approved. You know, it's always the Consumer Technology Association. They don't want to have AM radio. They want to have new technology sold. They are the major, um, you know, problem in here. But at least it seems like they are going through. So let's uh, hope it it really works. So there's, you know, something important about shortwave radio. Apparently, uh, lessons from the Optus network outage. Lucky you know about shortwave. This is via Texan Radios Australia. So there was a recent. Optus network outage in Australia, which left over 10 million people without phone service and internet access for a prolonged nine hours, is yet another reminder of the importance of preparedness. As more Australians question the wisdom of relying on a single network for both home internet and mobile phone service, it's a wake-up call for everyone to consider alternative methods of staying in touch with the outside world, like shortwave radio. The Optus network outage had a profound impact on daily lives for millions of Australians. Businesses, especially those heavily reliant on the uh, EFPOS machines, or the kind of point of sale machines basically, were among the hardest hit. One hospitality business in Sydney's inner suburbs, operating in a predominantly cashless society, saw an 80% drop in customers during the outage. For many, particularly the younger generation who have never experienced life without a phone, it was a bewildering experience. Many of the older generation enjoyed the day off. Events like the Optus outage serve as a stark reminder to be prepared for any emergency event or network outage. The outage disrupted not only daily life, but also critical emergency services. Some mobile phones couldn't reach triple zero, which is Australia's emergency number. And hospitals across the country, including virtual emergency departments in remote areas, were severely impacted. 
lives were at risk due to the inability to communicate with emergency services during this crisis. Why Shortwave Radio Matters? AM, FM, and shortwave radio, a technology over a century old, demonstrated its enduring value once again during the outage. When everything else, including the electrical grid, internet, and cell service fails, radio stood strong. It can relay information immediately if it's equipped with backup power, making it a reliable source of communication during emergencies. Tips for shortwave radio preparedness. First tip is to ensure that you and your family have an AM, FM, shortwave radios readily available. You never know when you might need them. The second tip is learn how to operate your radio. Practice tuning in and show your family and friends how to tune in to local and international stations to stay informed during an outage. The third tip is store your radio in an easily accessible location. In an emergency, every second counts. And the fourth tip is keep your radio charged or stocked up on fresh batteries to ensure it's always ready to use. It's easy to take for granted in our interconnected world, but when it's suddenly unavailable, the consequences can be dire. Shortwave radio, a time-tested technology, can be a lifeline in times of crisis, offering a reliable means of communication when all else fails. Don't wait until you need it. Be prepared. Keep your shortwave radio ready and ensure that everyone in your family knows how to use it. In a world of uncertainty, this simple yet powerful tool can make the difference. This reminds me of a little ice storm last year that we had, and my next-door neighbor suddenly realizing she doesn't have a radio and would have needed one, which, of course, I replied to that I have about 100, so you can come and pick one up. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, you know, I mean, the article, uh, Texan is a a, a big radio manufacturer, particularly shortwave radios, but this can apply to radio in general, not just shortwave radio. You want to have something that you can turn on, battery-operated, sometimes even solar-operated, crank-up, wind-up radios, something that will give you some information quickly when everything else stops working. And that's really what the lesson is with this article. And Australia found out the hard way. Um, You mentioned the uh, point-of-sale terminals, the ATMs, things like that. If they stop working, everything stops. You know, people people are online, aren't buying things. Uh, they can't, you know, if they, if that's their only way to communicate, and many people today seem it seems like that is the only way they communicate. That stops, um, and you have to go back to the old way of doing things. So you need the tools to do the old way of doing things. Yep, I mean uh, last year's little um, ice storm here uh, showed that uh, thanks that I had some cash in my wallet. Because I went out to get some coffee and something to eat just at the corner here. And what happened is that she was telling everybody, better have cash because the uh, terminals don't work for you know, paying with a card. So uh, it's important to, to be prepared. So what's happening with our son? Well, our son is pretty active once again this week. It had uh, several powerful flares, a little bit of disruption in the geomagnetic field, but not too bad of a week, though. Lots of good propagation most of the times. Uh, There is a a sunspot that was a potentially dangerous one coming back, which gave us a lot of flares when it was on the surface a few weeks ago. So AR-3663 is returning and could have uh, the potential to create more super powerful flares. So on the May 10th, there was that big you know, night of auroras when the geomagnetic storm hit the highest level in a very long time, more than 20 years. Uh, there is an interesting article, if you go to spaceweather.com, where they talk about the rocks in the soil that was electrified by the superstorm. And they say that across the USA on May 10th and 11th, sky watchers marveled at bright auroras during the biggest geomagnetic storm in decades. Little did they know, something was also happening underfoot. Strong electrical currents were surging through rocks and soil. The biggest voltages along the U.S. eastern seaboard and in the Midwest were as much as 10,000 times normal. There's a map on the, uh, the Space Weather website that uh, shows us the extent of the electricity. They're saying that uh, back in March 1989, voltages only a little stronger than the ones that we uh, actually experienced on May 10th, 11th, brought down the entire Hydro-Quebec power system. 
The resulting Great Quebec blackout plunged millions of Canadians into darkness. So they said um, that the voltages on the May 10th and 11th geomagnetic uh, amplitudes exceeded 10 volts per kilometer in Virginia and 9 in the upper Midwest. And they were saying that uh, to compare, we estimate that geomagnetic amplitudes reached almost 22 volts per kilometer in Virginia during the March 89th storm. And so they say that this is kind of a little warning to tell us that uh, we never know when something bad can happen again. And um, we weren't that far from, you know, the powers of the 1989 solar storm. The sunspot number is 100. The solar flux is at 176. There's uh, no real coronal holes that are a problem. But there are a few sunspots that might flare this week. So if conditions change abruptly, that could be the reason. And the only way that you can really know what's happening is to turn on a radio and listen. Hey, IRR listeners, there's another program, World of Radio, now well over 2,000 weekly editions, with multiple broadcasts on two major shortwave stations in the U.S., WRMI and WBCQ. Also, IRRS in Europe and Unique Radio in Australia. There are several chances to hear me, Glenn Hauser, on Sunday evenings, among others, and podcasts on demand. Full schedule info, plus loads of other material, especially about shortwave, at worldofradio.com. It's always exciting news to uh, radio listeners, radio hobbyists, to have a new target. And we have news this week of a new shortwave station that is emerging, this time from Finland. The headline is Radio Pico, uh, uh, 25th of May, 26th of May, 2024, test transmissions. This comes from Carrie Kaleo uh, via Glenn Hauser's World of Radio on May the 23rd. A new shortwave radio station broadcasting from Asikala, Finland, is planning for a launch on Saturday, June the 1st, 2024. The name of the station is Radio Pico. Test transmissions were due in late May. Frequencies are 3990, 5980, and 9770 kilohertz. And the station will be active Saturdays and Sundays until August the 15th. The power is just 10 watts, and the format will be big band music. And uh, they have a webpage, uh, Radio Pico, P-I-K-O dot F-I. And it is described as an infamous triple L, low power, low antenna, low budget operation. So they'll be on the air, 1600 to 1700 uh, on 9770, targeting Norway and Denmark. 1800 to 1900 UTC on 5980, targeting Finland. And 19 to 2000 UTC on 3990 kilohertz, targeting Finland, Sweden, and Estonia. And random tests will be on uh, all three frequencies at, at random times. And a lot of this information from Stig Hartvig Nielsen. Uh, you were taking a, a look at their website and have a little more information on just what they're going to be broadcasting. First of all, why Radio Pico? Because it would be nice to transmit something else than FT8 Magic Flute while I am at a transmitter. Uh, target listeners are to be uh, mostly in uh, Finland and, uh, of course, some Nord Nordic countries. They're going to be using an ICOM IC735 or a Kenwood TS430 for the transmissions on a simple halfway dipole wire. Uh, the uh, broadcast will be mostly uh, music made before the 1950s. And uh, there will be old-time radio shows, American Forces radio swing bands for, from wartime broadcasts, and some interviews. There will be some slow-scan television. So if you hear some weird sounds coming out of their broadcast, uh, slow-scan television images will be sent. Is the station legal? Yes, it is. Uh, meaning that uh, the frequencies and uh, all of that has been uh, active. And their license is going through August the 1st. There's a QSL card available by eqsl at picofinland at gmail.com. So uh, this is going to be interesting. 10 watts is not a lot of power. I think this is uh, going to be a good DX target. 
Yeah, North American listeners may have a problem at the times and frequencies, but uh, you can certainly try to use some online uh, uh, SDR receivers to check them out. And uh, people, any of our listeners overseas, uh, you know, be interesting to see just how far the signal can reach uh, using shortwave frequencies. Interesting that they're using ham radio transceivers as yep. their uh, transmitters. So that's pretty unique as well. So uh, give it a shot. Uh, be I'll always be interested if you're able to pull anything in. Let us know um, and uh, check it out. Our next story is... Um, Kind of an important one. It comes from an odd source. It's called the Sarcastosaurus blog. And I looked at the blog, too. It's got a lot of interesting stuff on it. But um, our friend Walt Salman, who at NBC, pulled a, a particular story dealing with Ukrainian tactical communications. A Ukrainian specialist said that Ukraine has a shortage of radios in the first year. But that is no longer the case, and the radios are encrypted. The army has to change the encryption key regularly and make sure that Russia doesn't capture the keys. If a radio is captured, or if they are unsure about the status of a radio, all the radios on that network have to immediately change their encryption key. The radios do not frequency hop, which makes it easier to locate, intercept, and jam transmissions. Starlink is the primary data transmission network, but they have other systems as backups, such as the two-way satellite system. When buying radios, they avoided Chinese equipment for security reasons. Russia buys Chinese systems, and the inferior components result in poor reception at times. Theoretically, mobile phones are banned from the front line to prevent the Russians locating positions and intercepting communications. In reality, everyone puts their phones in the silent mode on the front lines, and the further back they are, the more likely they are to use it. Everyone uses their phones by the time they are 5 to 7 kilometers from the front. In fact, the platoon, company, and battalion message groups that are formed are useful for soldiers to share their experiences and knowledge. The risk is if a soldier is killed or captured and his phone falls into the hands of the enemy, allowing them to read the messages as well. The way to mitigate the risk is for the administration to remove a compromised member and to change the password daily. There have been attempts of unknown military personnel trying to join a group with the proper documentation, but when they didn't know the right password required to join, they disappeared. Different jammers work at different frequencies used by navigation, satellites, drones, radios, and phones. These jammers are mounted on vehicles that have to operate far from the front lines because it is easy to spot them even six kilometers from the front lines. Of these kinds of systems, Ukraine has only 30% of what they need. Portable jammers are used in trenches and vehicles to defend against drones that come close. The government doesn't create these types of devices, and the number of civilian-made devices only meet a very small fraction of Ukraine's needs. One reason there are so few civilian-made systems is because companies are worried about being accused of overcharging the government or not making enough profit. Another reason is that most of the components needed are Chinese, and it's illegal to import them. Any use of jammers needs to be coordinated with Ukrainian drone operators because they will knock Ukrainian dr drones down as well. That's one of the problems that Russia has. Another problem is the Russian reconnaissance drones that fly 50 to 80 kilometers behind the front lines. If they are detected, then units in the area should freeze so they won't be detected. If a vehicle is moving, it should keep moving faster and away from the front lines where a lancet could come from. If the Russian recon drone is not detected, then a refueling truck will eventually lead to a fuel depot or a military vehicle will lead to a military unit and a Russian missile will arrive soon after. He confirms that a Patriot component was destroyed after stopping for too long. The EW specialist proposes that drone detection devices be built for $100. Once it is known that a drone is in the area, actions can be taken to minimize the risk. The Ukrainian government needs to establish policies regarding acquisition, production, sale, and utilization of portable jammers. 
Russian electronic warfare is improving. They are producing more drones than Ukraine, and drones are starting to fly day and night. At some point, it is likely that Russia will be able to saturate the front with drones, meaning all the frequencies in a given territory will be used by drones, and Ukraine will need to have a way to counter them or suffer their attacks. So this is definitely communications warfare going on. New equipment, uh, the, the the emergence of drones for so many different purposes. Um, you know, it's hard to keep track of all of this. They've had to develop new systems to try to keep track and try to protect uh, themselves from these new invaders that are coming from the sky unmanned. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it, it can be really, really dangerous at the information that those drones are gathering. So... Um, the communications and the uh, the technology battle continues on the war front. So we have upcoming ham radio contests. Lots of things taking place next weekend for the ham operators and anybody else who likes to tune into the ham bands. We have the PODXS 070 Club's three-day weekend contest, 0 Zulu, May 31st to 2359 Zulu, June 2nd. That's organized by the Penn Ohio DX Society. And the purpose is to work as many stations as possible using PSK 31 mode during the three-day weekend. The bands 160 through six meters, and the mode is PSK 31. There's the 1010 International Open Season PSK Contest from 0 Zulu, June 1st to 2359 Zulu, June 2nd. The purpose is to stimulate PSK activity on the 10-meter band. Mode, BPSK31. All contacts must be two-way, BPSK31, and it's on 10 meters. The TISA Cup CW contest, 0200 to 1459 Zulu, June the 1st. That is organized by the Debrecen University Amateur Radio Club in Hungary. The band's 160 through 10 meters. And this contest is CW only. There's a Kentucky QSO party, 1300 Zulu, June 1st to 01 Zulu, June 2nd, organized by the Kentucky Contest Group. Mode, CW, SSB, digital, RTTY only in the digital mode. Bands are 160 through 2 meters, no work bands. The IARU is holding their Region 1 field day. It's organized by the Deutsche Amateur Radio Club. It is 1500 Zulu, June 1st to 1459 Zulu, June 2nd. The band's uh, 1.8 through 28 megahertz, uh, so all the basic HF bands, no uh, work bands, and the mode for that one is CW. The ARRL International Digital Contest, 1800 Zulu, June 1st to 2359 Zulu, June 2nd organized by the American Radio Relay League, digital modes, and it's 160 through 6 meters, no org bands. All right, that is going to do it for us this week. We thank you for tuning in. If you would like to reach us, you can send an email to radioreport at yahoo.com. Our program is live streaming and archived on the CKUT website, ckut.ca. Our Facebook group, International Radio Report, we invite you to join. We have 955 members. Our YouTube channel is youtube.com slash at IRR. We're approaching 1,000 subscribers. If you'd like to listen to our show on YouTube at your convenience and go back and listen to previous shows, we suggest you subscribe to the channel. And from time to time, we have special programs on there as well, which do not air on uh, the radio. Uh, we'll have a new one coming up shortly, actually. So we invite you to uh, subscribe to our channel. And our X account, a few new members this week at IRRCKUT. You can follow us there. We'll talk to you again next Sunday on CKUT 90.3 FM in Montreal with the International Radio Report. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs> This is Trans World Radio, broadcasting from the sunshiny island of Bonaire in the Netherlands Antilles, the international sound of the Caribbean.